I'm gonna draw that. I'm gonna draw. Okay. Nope. Hi everyone. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Dina, and yes, I got a haircut. I feel like I look like a cool mom. I think I also kind of look like the bad guy from the Disney Channel original movie Brink. Let me know down in the comments which one you think it is, or maybe it's both. Today I'm doing an update on my recently read and currently reading books. It's been a while since I did my last update, my first update, so I definitely have more read than currently reading books. I've also had a lot more work coming in and been doing a little more stuff lately, so I haven't been reading as much. To be honest, my focus has been a little off lately, so reading has not been a total priority just because of everything else going on, but I have enough now to update you. If I'm looking down, it's because I'm reading notes off my laptop. The first book was an audiobook that I listened to called Too Much and Never Enough, How My Family Created the World's Most Dangerous Man by Mary L. Trump. And I think you can guess what this is about. It kind of chronicles Mary's life. She's Donald Trump's niece, the daughter of his oldest brother, who unfortunately passed away at a really young age. I think he was around 40. It talks a lot about the family dynamic. Her grandfather, Fred Trump, was kind of a sociopath. Marielle Trump is a psychologist, so she does talk about them from a clinical perspective and all the different behavioral patterns that they had and that she noticed in her family. The family is as toxic and greedy as you'd expect the Trumps to have been. Throughout the book, she creates a narrative of how the characters in the Trump family, especially Donald Trump, came to be who they are through the treatment of their parents. So it sort of gave context and background as to how a person like Donald Trump could have grown up to be the way that he was because of the treatment from his parents, emotional abandonment of his mother, Fred's just toxic emotional abuse over him and his siblings. Mary's insight from within the family really satisfied the chismosa in me. I can't help it, I'm so interested in people's personal lives. I've always been, I love reality shows, so this kind of satisfied that. I don't think I would have finished it as a physical book. I think I only really got through it because I would listen to it while I was driving or washing dishes because it didn't really bring anything new. It was insightful to learn about the background of the family and their dynamics with one another and how they interacted, but part of me feels like this book would have been a lot more impactful if it had been released in like 2014 before November 2015 about that reminded me of Stephen King's The Dead Zone. It was a novel about this man who could tell the future and who could read people and met this rising politician and knew that he would be dangerous for the country if he would be elected. He tries to come up with a plan to stop him and warn the public. He was sort of a Cassandra in that he had all of this information but no one would really believe him unless they saw firsthand the true damage that could be done. That is kind of the same thing that happened here. Obviously most people knew going into 2015 what kind of damage Donald Trump could have done growing up inside the family knew his psychological makeup. It was a rift in the family because she didn't vote for him, she didn't support him, um, and wanted to warn the public about what would happen if he would be elected. But obviously everyone is wiser with hindsight. I don't think it was life-changing by any means. It was well written and if you listen to the audiobook, Mary Trump does read it out and she has a really good voice. The next book was Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo and I really enjoyed this. I personally love the way that the cast of characters flowed and also didn't flow. A lot of the criticisms around the book was that it jumped from character to character without so much logic. I think that was an intended effect of the book. Um, on my Instagram review I said that it kind of reminded me of Mrs. Dalloway because it felt as the reader that we were jumping from one perspective to another and it kind of reminds you that although you are always the protagonist in your own life and everyone else is a side character, goes the same for everyone else, that you are a side character in their lives. It almost paints a visual picture of how, although everyone's lives intersect at different points, ultimately people's trajectories are, are individual. And I also wrote in my notes that I particularly love the use of distant and intimate relationships to explore identity and belonging. Each person in the story is connected to one another in some way, whether by blood, friendship, school, etc and they seem to all orbit around the event of a new play about black women warriors, one that has broken out of the fringe artsy scene and into commercial mainstream theater. I also really like the conversation about sticking to one's artsy fringe 
roots and then also wanting to break into mainstream commercial success. I think as a writer I deal with that every single day where I struggle in staying true to the art itself and also having to work and make money. One of the critiques that I had was that the depiction of today's youth was just totally off. Her characterization of Yaz stood out so much because it felt like a caricature, which was unfortunate because all the other characters were so dynamic and believable and true. It just kind of felt off in her depiction of, of the youth. It felt super exaggerated and cartoonish, but this didn't ruin the reading experience at all. It was just a little hiccup and honestly it made it a little more funny. The next book is The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. So this chronicles the Great Migration, which was a movement of around 6 million Black Americans from the Jim Crow South to cities in the North and the West. And this happened over generations. It started from around the 1920s all the way up to the 1970s. There was so much more job opportunities and streams of wealth in the North, and also because they faced violent racism and oppression in the South. I really enjoyed this. I've been reading a lot more nonfiction lately. Don't really know why. I mentioned this in my last update, but I really love Wilkerson's narrative voice. It doesn't read as much of a history book as it does a biography. Wilkerson also zoomed into the lives of three people, Ida May, who migrated from Mississippi to Chicago, George from Florida to Harlem, and Robert, who migrated from Louisiana to Los Angeles, California. I think in school we did learn about the movement as a whole. We didn't go into as much depth as I think we should because it was so consequential to American history and culture, especially the makeup of the North and the South. Person did such a great job of humanizing the movement that when we learn about these types of historical events, we look at them from a generalized perspective in how they affected a country's history or a culture, and we don't look into the individual experiences as much. I really appreciated the amount of time and effort that Wilkerson put into interviewing and getting to know these individuals. It's obvious through her storytelling that she got really close to the characters. Um, she drove Ida Mae from Chicago down to the south for a funeral. She was there in Robert's last days, and it seems like she visited them at different points of their lives. It was really moving to see how compassionate she was about them, not just as subjects, but also people and friends. I wrote that this work is important as well as moving to read because it expounds on the foundation and the makeup of American culture as we know it. When I was reading this, I thought of all the so significant cultural events like jazz, Toni Morrison, Michelle Obama. It was really interesting to read about it and think about how all the different things that we know about American culture, black culture, are products of the Great Migration. As the Harlem Renaissance, hip hop, hyphy in Oakland were all byproducts of people uprooting their lives and coming to the northern and western cities, creating their own cultures there. I also appreciated how Wilkerson dove into the nuances and the shortcomings of the American dream. As an immigrant and child of immigrants myself, I think that I've faced sort of the same promises in the reckoning of the American dream and what it means and what it doesn't mean. also really appreciated how she shined a light on racism in the North. I think that throughout the Great Migration and even now, that the North and the West are painted as these liberal, enlightened places where everyone is free. Officially, it should have been that way, but migrants still faced a lot of prejudice, violent and non-violent, covert and overt, from people who live there, from immigrants themselves. Huge riots in cities like Chicago from both white Americans and also white immigrants because they did not want black people to live near them. That sort of affected the demographic makeup of these cities today. So it was really interesting and also very disheartening to see. I do think that we need to recognize that prejudice and hardship runs far and deep in American soil and that you can't really escape it. <laughs> something I've learned, I think that's something that a lot of immigrants and migrants have learned. But on that note, I highly recommend this to Americans, to immigrants, to migrants, to people who were born here, to anyone who wants to know more about the makeup of American cities and also American culture. Um, it is a really thick book. I think it's around 600 pages. The way that Wilkerson writes and breaks up the chapters makes a really good flow of reading. Starts each chapter with a sort of recap of the last one. And it got a little annoying when I marathoned the book, but it did help a lot when I'd put it down for a little bit and then pick it back up because I didn't have to skim back at the last few pages. It's really useful in long nonfiction. It keeps your attention and so helps you retain the information 
and stories better. I'm definitely going to check out her other book called Cast. I think she's a phenomenal writer and I highly recommend this. Next book is Angela's Ashes by Frank McCourt. And I read this the buddy read with my friend Jenny from Jenny Cook Reads. Hi Jenny! Um, I recommend her channel so much. We have really similar reading tastes and also I think personalities. She has a phenomenal Irish accent. I'm not gonna talk in the Irish accent. Oh! Here's a receipt for an iced Cubano coffee. This is Frank McCourt's memoir. He was born in Brooklyn, New York. The Great Depression and hardships in finding jobs. They moved back to Limerick, Ireland. The book chronicles his childhood growing up, sort of in the slums, father never really being able to hold on to a job, the typical Irish plight and hardship. I remember picking this up when I was like 10 at a Costco. It was definitely not for me at 10, and I am glad that I revisited it at 25 because it was really good. The story is really sad. I don't think I was expecting it to be so funny. I think his sarcasm and dry wit was a perfect match to the horrible and tragic events of his childhood definitely helped you move through the pages that I would have been able to appreciate the story as much and also recognize the incredible resilience without his humor. Jenny mentioned in her own review that she liked the theme of family and I also appreciated that always fighting and someone was always not talking to another person they helped one another and where they didn't have time to feel sorry for themselves because they were too busy picking themselves up by the bootstraps, you know, all that junk. I was surprised by all the parallels that I saw between Irish culture and Filipino culture. I don't know a lot about Irish culture and literature. I know that it is characteristically sad. I did know that they're a mostly Catholic country and growing up as a Filipino Roman Catholic, I saw so many similarities, sort of ritualistic affinity with patron saints and sacraments, the obsession of martyrdom and virtuous struggle, carrying your own cross through life and bearing it because you're one with Jesus. It was very amusing to me. A lot of the women throughout the book would say Jesus Mary Joseph as a sort of, I was about to say excrement, it's not excrement, exclamation. Interjection. We have a similar thing in the Philippines. We say Sus Mariosep, basically a giant conjunction of Jesus, Mary, Joseph. Sus Mariosep. Parallels I saw is that Filipino families will talk shit about you to no end, but will grab your hand and take you to buy new clothes and food if they see that you're struggling, praying to different patron saints for the randomest specific things. Obviously, that Someone is always not talking to someone. I have a really big family on both sides and there's always drama somewhere. So just like Frank dealt with with his auntie Aggie, I too have dealt with titas. I recommend this to other lapsed Catholic immigrants because it does have such a great conversation on the immigrant experience in both the US and your home country. So anyone who likes dry sarcastic humor, McCourt was really funny. He also had a sort of feud with someone from Limerick and on a talk show and heckled him and cussed him out. I'm gonna link it below but it's hilarious. This Irish YouTuber made a video where he memorized the entire interview <laughs> and just sort of commentates on it. I'm gonna link both below because they're so funny. But I do recommend this. I'm going to read Tiz, his next memoir that kind of picks up where he left off in this one. Um, I think I'm also going to buddy read that with Jenny. I will also link her video below because she's awesome. Subscribe to her if you want an English version of me. Those were the books that I recently read. Alright, so I'm not reading a lot at the moment. I know in my last video I mentioned The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. I was taking a break. Well, the break turned into a sabbatical and I've not read it since before that video. It's not that I don't like it, I'm just not very interested in it in the moment. Come back to it soon, I might not. That's just how it is. It's not going anywhere, it's still on my bedside table. So the book I'm currently reading is called Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall. I'm reading this with the Tall Tales Book Club on Instagram hosted by my friends Tally and Cynthia. I'm gonna link their Instagrams and Tally's YouTube below because she is a phenomenal vlogger. Her aesthetic is... So we're reading this. I'm gonna be honest and say that I'm not super impressed by the book and that it was about intersectionality and in feminism and how mainstream feminism has failed marginalized voices and it doesn't help women that don't fit into certain boxes. Mickey Kendall talks about poverty, gun violence, healthcare, colonialism, 
the fetishization of women of color, which are incredibly important topics. She makes really great points, but at times I feel like I don't know what type of audience this is for. My memory card was full, I switched it out, blah 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 blah. Okay. You say that it's a really good introduction to intersectional feminism, which I agree with. It's a lot of these concise statements and points that are important to know, but I don't think that this should or could be read alone. There's an airplane. I live near the airport, sorry. People in the book club have mentioned this, but it seems that the book is lacking statistics or informational support. It definitely comes up in my reading experience. I think that for books like this, which are highly political and bring a lot of sociological context, it's important to support your statements with facts and statistics, but also to make sure that the reader has a solid foundation of understanding these important points like gun violence, poverty, health coverage or the lack thereof. In my opinion, it feels like the book makes these big important statements without providing first the supporting facts or logically driving the reader there. For example, and as a trigger warning, this book does talk about rape and sexual violence. So on page 58, Kendall states that colonialism and imperialism rely heavily on the use of rape as a tool of genocide. I agree with the statement, but in my perspective, it's a conclusion that I've come to because I had the privilege of taking classes on colonialism to read texts and studies that support my conclusion. In the book, the statement is provided without supporting facts or details. So a person who is coming to this as an introduction and who isn't as versed in the conversation of colonialism and its ties to rape and misogyny would need more context and explanation. I think in a nonfiction book like this, it's important to have either objective discourse or provide context in your subjective discourse. From my reading experience, it feels like the book doesn't give the reader room enough to come up with their own conclusion, nor does it provide enough context to support the conclusions it states. So while I do agree with these conclusions and I think that they're true, my opinion from this comes from outside research. So while I do recommend this and think that it is a great introduction into intersectional feminism, I would highly recommend reading it in conjunction with other books and authors. Two books that I would recommend reading with hood feminism would be So You Want to Talk About Race by Ajoma Oluo, and Me and White Supremacy by Leila F. Saad. I think combined, these three books would provide the perfect introduction into intersectional feminism. Have a good mixture of conclusions, supporting facts, and personal memoir. That's the only book I'm reading at the moment because my attention span is non-existent. But I also wanted to mention the magazine I'm currently reading and obsessing over. It's called Bitch. Not really into magazines. I'm going to be transparent and say that I was only in the section because I was looking for BTS stuff. I came across this because it shined in my eyes. So it's a feminist magazine that talks about pop culture, literature, I also noticed a little bit of contemporary sociology as well. So I'm reading this very slowly because I want to savor it and not rush through the articles. We enjoyed Mary Retta's article called Boomer to Zoomer. Grim generational relations aren't an accident and it sort of talks about that really weird Gen Z versus Millennial war that's happening on TikTok. Oh, it's kind of bullshit. As someone who was born in 1996, I've been placed in both groups. I think I'm on the tail end of Millennials, but I'm also in the very front of the Gen Zs. But I've seen both sides of the argument. I think both are stupid. With the dawn of social media and our presence online, these generational gaps have just been more emphasized, way more than they have been in the past. And the memes are funny, but I also think that we should take a step back and think about what this is doing to us cognitively. So I recommend that article. Also one that I'm really looking forward to reading about Queen Latifah and her importance in the rom-com genre. Queen Latifah is one of my favorite figures in pop culture. I've rewatched Beauty Shop probably nine times. I had the VHS. It wore out. I don't want to talk about it. I've also rewatched her episode in Fresh Prince so many times. Absolutely schools will and looks phenomenal and so down to earth while doing it. So I'm really excited to read this article about her. It's wonderfully long. I'm saving it for a bad day when I need a pick me up. I love about reading magazines. I used to be so into J14 like Tiger Beat when I was younger because I would be able to flip through and read different articles depending on my mood. I sort of fell out of magazines because I'm pretty cheap and I don't like spending money. For this, I think it's worth it. Sorry, I was reading it again. But I recommend Bitch Magazine. I'm gonna subscribe. It is so good. I'm getting back into magazines because of it. 
so that was my reading update i was gonna apologize for not uploading one sooner slash not reading as much but then i realized that this is my youtube channel and this is my reading experience i can't really apologize for that because it doesn't affect anyone else i hope you liked it let me know down in the comments if you've read any of the books i mentioned or if you've read bitch magazine so i can fangirl with you thank you so much for watching I wish I could say that I'm going to be more regular in my videos, but with the nature of my work as a freelancer, work comes up very sporadically, so some weeks I have nothing to do, some weeks I'm very busy. It just happens. Hope that you join me in my little corner of the world by subscribing and liking this video. Hope you're having a great day. I am. I'm going to go wipe my makeup off and read my magazine. Bye!